Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're situated in this lovely country of Canada. My name is Lisa Campardo, and I work for the Royal Bank as a community manager for the Strathcona market in Vancouver. I'm joining you today from the Strathcona community, located on the traditional and ancestral and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, Squamish, Salwatooth, and Musqueam nations. RBC is thrilled to be a presenting sponsor of this very important program, enabling our youth in Canada to learn about the amazing culture and heritage of our Indigenous people. The flow for today's session will commence with the presentation from our Knowledge Keeper, who I'll introduce in just a moment, followed by your questions and answers. So please submit your questions through the Hubelo platform, including your grade, your name, and the city of the school that you are in. We will attempt to get through as many questions as we can. So today's presentation is entitled Keeping Reconciliation Alive, Learning from a Truth and Reconciliation Commissioner. I'm honored to introduce our knowledge keeper, Dr. Marie Wilson, one of the three commissioners of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which ran from 2009 to 2015. Dr. Marie Wilson is also a former journalist, high school teacher, executive, university lecturer, and consultant. We are pleased to welcome you to this insightful presentation that Dr. Marie Wilson has prepared for you. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Wilson. Thank you very much, Lisa, and hello to all of the students out there and all of the teachers. I'm really appreciative of your presence here today. I'm really honored to be part of this conversation and to share with you uh, what I know and most importantly, what I have learned, um, what we have been taught, all of us as a country, uh, during the six and a half years that I served as one of the three commissioners of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Uh, I'm in, in Ottawa today, as it turns out, um, but normally I live in Yellowknife, which is Treaty 8 territory and uh, part of the Dene Nation homeland, it's the home of the related Dene people and the Yellowknife's Dene. And so a special shout out to any of the kids from North of 60 and from the territories who may be watching. Um, I want to tell you about my journey as one of the three Truth and Reconciliation Commissioners. Um, and perhaps just to pause because I'm aware that there are some younger students and some older students. Just to pause for a second as well and talk about what is a commission anyway and what do they try to do and what's a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So hoping that um, we are going to be able to make the technology work. There we are. What is a TRC, which stands for Truth and Reconciliation Commission? So these are the questions I want us to ponder. Why did Canada need to have one? And the reason that's an important question, we were the first country, the so-called Western or wealthy democracies uh, to ever have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We were the first commission ever that came about um, because of a court case and not because uh, a, a government decided we should have one. And we were the first ones, uh, one ever to happen with a focus on trying, because a commission is really like a big, long national conversation, if I could put it that way. It's a group that is tasked with digging into an issue, trying to understand what it's about and trying to educate our country about what we learn. And ours was the first one also to ever look at uh, an issue that was really about children, something that happened to children because of laws that were passed in Canada, because of policies in Canada, because of practices in the schools, because of things that some teachers and supervisors did or did not do. And so, and, it, and it's about a history that's also very, very long. Most truth and reconciliation commissions happen for example, after a war, to try to find out how do we put the pieces of our, our community back together again? How do we get people to feel okay being with each other again? And in our case, it, it was really about trying to learn lessons of something that wasn't short-term the way wars tend to be, but very, very, very long because we had residential schools in Canada even before Canada became a country. So over 150 years. That's a lot of time for things, if they're going wrong, that's a lot of time for them to get really wrong and to have deep and lasting impacts across seven generations of, of children and their families. I also want to talk then a bit about who are the heroes of the TRC story and how did it lead us to this very special week and the attention we're all paying 
to a National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. And then the question that really I want you all to put your, wrap your hearts around as well as your heads is how can you, the students and teachers of today, uh, become the heroes in the next chapter of Canada's history? So let's, um, let's start at the beginning. And so happens that's where, this is where I am today. I'm right here in Ottawa and I'm actually at Rideau Hall, which is the home and the residence and the workplace of the Governor General of Canada. And the Governor General, you may know recently was named as the first Indigenous person ever to be in that role, Her Excellency the Honourable Mary Simon. And uh, she uh, works here on behalf of all the people of Canada and is kind of like the the um, connector between the Queen, which is part of our government structure, and the Canadian government and the people of Canada, especially the people of Canada. So we started our work here um, in, in one of the big rooms in this place called Rideau Hall. Perhaps some of you have seen pictures of it, maybe there are even a few of you who have been here, but it's a very special place. Um, and the reason it's part of the story is because this is where things get signed off that are laws and policies. And back 150 years ago, some of the laws that we passed in this country and some of our beliefs and attitudes about each other um, were very negative in the sense that there was a deep feeling that um, some people were superior and other people were inferior. And the laws reflected that. Today, we know we have issues of racism and prejudice still in our society and we're not pretending we don't. But we don't have laws that make that be the norm, uh, except for the one and only and the Indian Act. And I'm not going to get into all the details of that. I think you may have heard about that earlier in the week. But we kicked it off here. We were very intentional to be in the shape of a circle because we at the Commission wanted to believe that that's what we're trying to do is become a, be a form of a country where everybody has a place and it's not some people at the front and everybody at the back and others left behind altogether. These are my commissioner colleagues and myself at the time. And this actually is a picture from the end of our work, but there are the three of us. Uh, two of the commissioners are indigenous people um, and uh, myself as a non-indigenous person, but each of us having part of the story. So on the right, you'll see Chief Wilt of a Little Child who also was a residential school survivor and he's also a lawyer. And our chair in the middle, uh, Mr. Justice at the time, Murray Sinclair, went on to be a senator, is also a lawyer and was a judge. Uh, myself, I spent most of my life as a journalist and you heard some of that in the introduction. So the combination of understanding the law and understanding how to listen to stories and how to find the heart of the story, we brought those skills together. Um, a little child is also a residential school survivor. So we had that expertise. Sinclair was an intergenerational survivor, so his parents went. And in my case, my husband and my, and my brothers and sisters-in-law and my mother-in-law, in fact, they all went to residential school. So I had a different relationship with it all. And we all have, the three of us, children and grandchildren who are um, intergenerational survivors. Our job was to figure out how do we do this big work? How do three little people engage the whole country. And one of the most important things, and, and if I just back up for a second, I use the term preparing the kindling because I want to talk about fires. We need to get something burning in ourselves. Uh, we've seen a lot of desire and passion. So we've we got to keep that alive and that's the challenge I'm putting to you. So I've used that symbol of a fire um, that can light us up, that can warm us, can sustain us, can provide for us. Uh, but we have to be careful about it as well because it can also cause harm. So how do we do that? So the people who kind of lit the match and got us all going, I call them the heroes of the storm. Because I talked to you about a court case. Um, the reason we had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission is that the people in this picture and 80,000 other people across the country who went to residential schools, who were still alive at that time, they, they stood up with courage and said, what happened to us as little children was not right. And somebody has to be held to account. And so they went to court. They took the government to court and they took four national churches to court and they fought. And one of the things that they insisted on, because it ended up being settled out of court, they said, we have to have a way for our experiences 
what happened to us to be told, to be recorded, and to be never forgotten. And so they asked for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And that was my big job. That was our big job is how do we create spaces and opportunities and, and activities that will give them a chance to tell us what happened to them while they are all still alive and can tell us that. And some of the survivors of this picture sadly have passed over and are no longer with us. So we're talking about many elderly people uh, who, who have enormous expertise about the stories of their childhood that are about the stories of Canada that we all have to learn. So that's why I call them heroes. And then we, how do we get the word across the country? So I said, building fires across the country. So we tried to gather many places. These, uh, what's listed here, what you can see is respect, courage, love, truth, humility, honesty, wisdom. Some of you who are from an indigenous tradition will recognize those. They're sometimes called the seven sacred teachings or the seven grandfather teachings. But there are also values that are familiar in many faith traditions uh, that are not necessarily North American indigenous. Um, there are words that are familiar in Christianity and Islam and in Judaism. They're, they're words of goodness and kindness and bringing out the best of ourselves. So we tried to use these themes to anchor our events and our conversations and our welcome uh, around these values. You can see that we had, we were not only though in these locations, you can see that we can read well, Winnipeg, Inuvik, Halifax, Saskatoon, Montreal, Vancouver, Edmonton, north, south, east, and west. We were all over the country, but we were also in over 300 smaller communities. So we tried to go everywhere we could in the time we had with the resources we had. And this shows us out in the street because we were trying to be noisy. We were trying to, many of us have been involved in big walks this summer for different things. It was a way of drawing attention to ourselves to say, come on in, come and learn, come and be part of this, come and get a better understanding about our country. And we started education days. And what you're part of today is actually a continuation and an evolution of something we started during the TRC. We wanted to create an opportunity for Indigenous and non-Indigenous students to come together to experience being with each other in class, because often that's not the case even today, uh, and to have a chance to learn firsthand from residential school survivors, because many Indigenous students also did not know this history of their own families, because people didn't want to talk about it, because it was painful to talk about. Talking, and, and parents and grandparents were afraid of hurting their kids, or, or there was a lot of negative feeling, or they felt that they would fall apart talking about it. So there's a lot of silence around it. And so when I say hero, or when I say courage, it's people who found it somehow to say, I'm, I'm gonna start talking about the things that I have kept silent. Some people would say for 50 or 60 years, they would tell us I have never told anybody this before, or I have never told my children before, or I've never told my, my wife or my husband about this before. And so it was a big un, uh, revelation right across the country and it touched us, it touched us all and it helped us see each other uh, differently and better uh, and of course all to be richer from that experience. And as you can see, the rest of the world is paying attention. Canada has done something huge with our Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the rest of the countries very often I'm speaking around the world because people want to know what did you do and how did you do it? And what made it work and what are the lessons you learned from? It? So let's carry on. You can see now I'm saying fanning the flames. How do you get it going, keeping it alive? So this was just really a variation. That other picture was from Halifax. This one is from Saskatoon. And we again had a big noisy, uh, colorful entrance into our activities so people would be aware if they hadn't heard that they would know they were welcome and they would come. Um, and uh, we heard from almost 7,000 former students and sometimes their children or grandchildren and sometimes non-Indigenous people as well who wanted us to know how they felt about all this now that they knew because that's the one thing that everyone had in common. No one had been taught about it in their schools. And you're the privileged generation now that gets to learn about these things. And you have a huge responsibility to pay attention to it and to not forget it and to pass it forward, maybe to take the conversations home 
um, to your supper tables and to, with your friends and others to help them know as well so that we can all start to have the, a shared understanding uh, and light the way by our own good examples. So then how do you keep the fire alive? You're fanning the flames. How do you keep it alive? Teaching and learning as we go. So one of the things I told you is it wasn't just non-Indigenous people who had to learn. One of the things that happened because of residential schools and other laws is that a lot of Indigenous practices were made illegal. Uh, people were not allowed to do a lot of ceremonial things, including Indigenous ways of praying. Uh, we're not allowed to drum and all sorts of other things that now we, we tend to take it for granted, or many of us are very regularly exposed to that, and many of you may be part of that. But that's recent history. So what this was, was an opportunity. We saw, this was the, in BC and the West Coast, and we were told that the tradition we were part of here as a Truth and Reconciliation Commission was actually a very old tradition um, that some um, younger people had never seen before. And it was to arrive in a ceremonial way, a symbolic way, with our paddles in the air. And that was to indicate that there was no aggression. We didn't intend to do, uh, we didn't intend to attack. We also had to back our canoes in um, to show that we were not there in an aggressive or invasive way. And we had to stand up in the canoe and shout from the canoe to tell the people on shore what, what, why we were coming there, what we wanted to do there what our intention was, what our purpose was, and that it was a good purpose, that it was not a harmful purpose, and that we were not going to injure anyone or do any damage. And then we were invited to come ashore. So it was a very beautiful thing to be part of, but it was also a beautiful thing to teach others, and including young people, Indigenous and non-Indigenous children, as we, as we went along. And then spreading the sparks to keep, keep the fire going. And I almost hate to talk about that, especially for children in BC where it's been such a devastating summer in Alberta as well with so many fires. But I mean fire in the good way uh, that we know fire can be. Um, but this is really to say we can all be helpers. So you're younger, so you may not know, but I'm sure many of your teachers do. You may recognize right in the middle there, uh, with the yellowish tie, that was one of our former prime ministers. That's the right honorable Joe Clark. And our, our chair, the people that were in that first picture I showed you, that's me beside him. And on the other side, our chair, Justice Sinclair, and Chief Littlechild was on the far side. Um, uh, Sheila Rogers, who's very well known CBC broadcaster, is there with the bluish scarf. And on the other side, people who have been hugely important in Canada with the Auditor General's office, so keeping track of all of our country's money and how does it get spent and do we spend it well. The, the, there are people who keep track of that, that's their job. And then the person beside in the black, blackish dress, that woman was in charge of the Human Rights Commissions for one of our biggest provinces to make sure that people are not being mistreated. And one of our Indian Affairs Ministers as well is beside uh, her, he, he's now deceased, but I mentioned him. And, I, and then the person on the far left on your screen is a man named Robbie Weissman. But he came to us and wanted to be part of our work because he grew up in Europe. In a, you probably heard about the Holocaust and the younger ones of you will learn about it, uh, where we had a terrible case in the world where we were, we were very prejudicial against Jewish people and people were actually um, rounded up and severely mistreated to the point of of death, and this is a man who was a little boy in one of those camps, and he said, I feel like a survivor in solidarity when I hear about what happened to residential school children, um, because it sounds like my own childhood. So people who relate to the, to the issue of human rights, no matter what tradition you come from, that we should be living to that high standard of goodness. But the other part that's really important about this story is here we have somebody who is a prime minister of Canada. We have somebody who is a human rights person, somebody who is a minister for the whole Department of Indigenous Affairs. And you know what they told us? They told us that until they came to our events and they actually heard firsthand from people who had been in the residential schools and their childhood experiences, they had not fully understood how difficult it was, how bad it was, how difficult it has been to recover from it and the impact that it has had on multiple generations. So the more we understand, the better we can be at 
doing things differently and doing things better. And, and that's why I think it's so important that you're all learning. Um, and I hope that you're able to understand all of these very grown up kind of things that I'm telling you about, but they're about children. Um, they're about children your age and much, much younger, your little brothers and sisters. And so here are the kids. And many of these children were there because they were the age of children that when they were taking away the residential schools, very, very far from their parents, from their home communities. And some of them were gone for 10 or 11 years at a time without ever going home. And some of them uh, were there for the whole school year and they only got to go home for six weeks or so in the summertime. And so they were very lonely and scared, many of them. And some of them were just extremely confused because they spoke different languages and didn't understand what was being said. But the one thing that we heard people tell us many times over is never were they celebrated as individual children. And the one thing most of us get to experience, I know it's not everybody, but most of us get to experience you know, on our birthday, people remember that's our day that we were born and were celebrated one way or another. These were children in the residential schools who said they never had that, they never had a birthday celebration. So one of the things we tried to do at the end of all of our big events was have a big birthday party for everybody. We had cupcakes, everybody had a candle, but instead of just singing happy birthday in English or French, uh, we would call upon the grown-ups who were there if they could still remember how to sing or they had relearned how to sing in an indigenous language, they would offer it. And then there would be a different indigenous language and then a different indigenous language. And I know one of the things you're all always wondering about is what can we do? And maybe for some of you, if you're the right age, that's the thing you can seek out is, is there somebody in your community who would help you all learn whether it's happy birthday or some other song that would feel right for you to try to learn in, in an indigenous language. And so you're new flickers of light because every young person and all of you on the line, you, you are the new generation. Um, and with, with light um, comes uh, hope. Uh, and you represent that to all of us. I hope that doesn't sound too simplistic, but uh, new people make things, new possibilities uh, uh, an option. And then tending to the embers. And what do I mean by that? You know what the embers are, the ashes, and the very small, the last of the flames before the fire's gone altogether. Um, and this was to represent, um, of course, the evil for many. It represents that creature that lives amongst us that is meant to be the closest to the creator because they can fly the highest. Um, so they're very sacred in, in many, many traditions. They represent love. And um, so where those little embers are there, um, it's uh, often about the children who did not survive the experience of residential schools. And I'm sure you've heard about that. Some, some children, a lot of children actually died in the residential schools because of disease, or uh, because of illness or because of they didn't get proper food. And in some cases, because they tried to run away and, and didn't find their way home in time. Um, or um, in some cases, because they were, they were mistreated. Um, so lots of different reasons, but it's, we have to understand that is one of the things that happened. And it's why our schools have to be safe places and have to be um, spaces where children feel safe and where, um, uh, children also feel responsible towards each other in how they treat each other and how they care for each other. Um, where, where teachers also have to be uh, both safe for themselves and, and responsible in their dealings with each other and the children as well. And you all know all that, but we need to remind ourselves of that so we don't get off track. And um, so for the little children who died, the embers, those little coals, um, the fire is still beautiful at that point and it's not completely gone because we never forget people that we love who die. Uh, we still hold them, you know, they're still burning at some point in our lives, in our hearts and in our memories. So that's what I'm trying to tell you there. And then honoring the ashes themselves. And this is, this is a, a special rattle called a shishigun in, in the Cree tradition of the James Bay area where I was given this very special rattle, a, a baby rattle, and it's uh, it's used in prayerful ceremonies, but it's also that it was given to me to remind me of my responsibility, which I hope I'm conveying to you today, 
um, that we all have to do all that we can to remember the children is a way of honoring them. Um, and so that we also can be taught by the memory of them uh, to remind ourselves, of course, of their beauty as the children who were loved and who are not forgotten, but also that we can remind our country that it has to um, behave properly in its dealings with everyone, including uh, our, all of our little children. So how does that lead to this? So the sparks of hope, and I just want to leave you on this, this last page. Um, this is the very first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. I know some of you have already been celebrating it for a few years as Orange Shirt Day. But we wanted, and in our Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, we included a number of calls to action, meaning this stuff has to be done. That's what we were telling the governments and society and the schools and the churches. We were saying there are certain things that must be done. And this is one of those things we said must be done. We need a day in our calendar, in our national calendar, where everybody in the country knows this is a day where we stop and we pause and we honor those, the memory of those children. We remember the survivors who are still with us today, who have taught us so much, who have called our country to attention. And uh, we renew our promise to live in a better spirit of uh, respect and, and love and wisdom and truth, and humility and honesty and all those values that we, we talked about earlier, that we renew our promise to ourselves and to each other and, and to our, our collective as a country um, that we do that. And so Orange Shirt Day is probably how you'll end up knowing it, just like Remembrance Day. We think of that often as Poppy Day because it has a strong and powerful symbol. And uh, I know others have told you about the meaning of orange shirt, so I won't pause on that. But even our prime minister, so the, the boss of the country, if I can put it that way in terms of our government, he says there's no relationship more important to me and to Canada than the one with indigenous peoples. It's time for renewed nation to nation relationships. He said that several years ago and we need to hold him to account and hold governments to account to do well and to do right things. Um, there are a lot of TRC calls to, edu uh, to action about education, and I'll leave it to your teachers to zero in on what those specific ones are, but one of them, and you're being part of it today, is that we should teach our children better, we should teach them uh, about the true history of Canada, and this whole week has been about that for all of you, and so we're already doing better. Uh, but we can't let up. Uh, and then there was a call to action about the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. So I hope you all realize that you're being part of history this year. This is the very first time in the history of our whole country that we've had a National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. And to my knowledge, it is also the first time in the world that there has been a National Day, statutory day designated for the memory of something that happened, something really bad that happened uh, to children. And so it's a very important day. It's historic because this is the first. It will grow and it will become other things in years to come, but you are part of something very significant. And by your presence here today, you're contributing uh, to the impact of that. And finally, as we all know, orange is the color of fire. Before the orange shirt day was ever named, we already had you can see that little symbol in the top corner. That represents fire and the seven sacred teachings and orange was the color we used throughout our TRC work, our Truth and Reconciliation Commission work. And so I just leave you with this thought, firing up, you know that phrase, it means action. So let's, there's not one answer to what kind of action that might be, but if we keep thinking about it, keep talking about it, keep asking each other questions and suggestions, will come up with lots of good ideas and they will all make a tiny contribution as we move forward. So I think we might have time for a few questions now. I'd be yes, so happy do. to be here with you today. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. What an amazing presentation. Uh, I, I just wanted to briefly share that uh, I have a daughter uh, she's now in university and she was inspired to pursue her education. She's now in political science and she wants to do and invoke change. And it was because of the TRC that really compelled her to see there were so many injustices in the world and, and she wants to do that. And we have so many children on the line today joining us. 
And I'm quite confident that you have touched the hearts of a little boy or little girl out there and that we will have some change and vote from them. We have some questions I'm excited to share. And the first one that we're gonna to get to is from West Park School in Montreal, Quebec. And the question is, can you share with us, Dr. Wilson, why September 30th was specifically chosen as the national day? Well, yes, um, the 30th, I can't be so precise about that, but the month, absolutely. And you all know you tend to go back to school at the beginning of September. We do want to have it right at the beginning when your teachers are already going crazy with school year and supplies and, and where everybody sits and finding your way to the washroom and whatever all goes on at the beginning of the school year. We want a time for you to settle in and get a sense of each other. Um, and so you need a bit of time. But why September? So uh, I'm just going to tell you one thing uh, it, that tells the answer for all across the country because I heard versions of it. Um, a very elderly woman said to me in one location, and she was reflecting inwardly, she said, she closed her eyes and she said, September, everybody cry month, back of truck, all the kids gone, everybody cry. So it's because the experience of going away to school was not a happy thing. It was not a happy moment. It was a, a rupture from everything that's familiar to your family, uh, your, your community, your food, um, your, your siblings, um, because even where siblings were in the same school, in a lot of times in the residential schools, they were not allowed to talk to each other. The kids were separated from little kids, boys separated from girls, and punishments for talking across those lines. So imagine what that would be like for you. So that memory, if you're going to try to have a moment of, to be solemn, to be quiet, to think about things and to remember the damage is done and the lessons we need to learn and the little ones who did not survive the experience. It needs to be a somber moment. We already have a national Indigenous Day, which is in June, June 21st, the summer solstice. That's a kind of like liberation day. A lot of survivors told us getting out of school or home is like freedom. You know, it's another cycle is done. So we, we put it there. And so I often make the comparison for school children and others. If you think about Remembrance Day, where we remember the soldiers and wars and great losses and sacrifices and, and, and sadness, it is a grieving day in one way, but it is also an honoring day, most importantly. It's more like that for the residential school children, whereas National Indigenous Day is kind of more like Canada Day, where it's a celebration of culture and identity and in the case of Indigenous people, survival um, and, and uh, resurgence, I think. So they're different days. They have a different spirit. Each day has a spirit. That's the spirit of this day. Not, not the sadness like we should all feel down, but we should feel solemn and we should feel respectful and we should think and we should remember and we should promise. I think that that's a great segue into our, our next question. So uh, you've talked about tomorrow or is to be a day of, of somberness and, and, and reflection. So the question is, uh, I have a day off tomorrow. So what should I do to honor residential school survivors on September 30th? Yes, well, you know, I think we're asking this question and answering this question in a context where it's not safe to go anywhere and do anything we want. We are in the middle of a worldwide pandemic. And what's possible in one part of Canada right now this week may not be possible in all parts of Canada. It definitely is not possible in all parts of Canada. So the first is uh, be safe and stay safe. So that's your physical self. Uh, I think whether you are on your own or in your family bubble or whether you're at school or in your classroom, to have um, a quiet time. And, and interestingly, um, some Indigenous people have said rather than a moment of silence, maybe actually it should be a moment of drumming because um, that's a way of, it's a form of communicating with the ancestors and with the spirit world and so on. It's an acknowledgement. Uh, so I don't think how you use your, your special time is the same for everybody. And I'm certainly not going to suggest um, to prescribe how to do that. But I think to create time and space where you are quiet and thoughtful, and maybe you write your thoughts down. Um, uh, maybe you create your own ceremony. Maybe 
maybe you have a fire where you put your wishes in and let the smoke carry them away. I, I, you can invent things. I know that next year, I'm really hopeful that by then is one of our other calls to action is for a national monument here in Ottawa for residential school survivors. But we also talk about the importance of a national monument in every capital city. So where I live, that would be Yellowknife, but in other parts of the country, what is your capital city? And do they have a monument for residential school survivors? Um, perhaps you can play a role in helping to remind your provincial and territorial governments that you need one and you want one. Because in non-COVID times, that gives us a place to gather. And in your home communities, if you don't live in a capital city, maybe there is a sacred space that you already know of in your community, or you could ask people in your community if you might create one, or perhaps your school can designate one. These are all things to think about for, for space so that the time can be respectfully shared. That's wonderful. We only have time for one more question and, and I wanna thank all of the, the schools and students who, who did submit questions, uh, but this one's coming to us from Horton High School. These are grade 11 students and their question is- Where, what where are is, some, sorry, where is Horton High School? That is a great question. They <laughs> did not share with me where Horton High School is, but they are located in Canada. So we will leave it at, at that. Um, but Horton High School grade 11 students would like to know, what are some key actions that educators and students can take to ensure they are helping move truth and reconciliation forward? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I just, in terms of the day itself, I've just made a couple of suggestions that you might want to think about. Um, I think one of the things that is, um, for me, one of the really uh, stark parts of the residential school story, you know, was uh, that kids were separated from their own siblings and how devastating that was. And one of the things that schools often have, at least at the junior levels, they have like a big buddy system or, uh, this is a hard subject. And even for me today, and all due respect to the, to the more senior children um, and students, uh, I'm aware that there are some young ones too. So some of the things that I feel comfortable talking about and how I would phrase them for the older ones that you might be different from the younger ones, because age appropriate is hugely important. So maybe you can take on something where you could be the teachers uh, in a learning session with some of the younger ones in your school. Maybe there's something like that. What all are your recognition awards in your schools? You probably have athletic recognition awards. You probably have academic recognition awards. Do you have a reconciliation um, contribution award or a way of um, um, honoring significant efforts that have been made, whether in school or in the community, in the spirit of building respectful relations um, and coming to know each other better. I'm, I'm talking off the top of my head here now because I know the question is coming, but I think also put yourselves together after all of your sessions this week and brainstorm. I'm sure all of the answers are right there in your midst. You just haven't had that conversation yet. Um, but I think as you get to know more, Make sure that it's not just all about you, that you are sharing that, you're passing it forward, you're playing it forward, um, and maybe learning some valuable practical skills in the process, like how to, how to convene, how to organize a teaching session, um, what video effects you bring to that, and who talks, and what order, how you chair a meeting, all those kinds of things, they're all useful skills to have. That's wonderful, Dr. Wilson. So I did find out that Horton High School is in Nova Scotia. So thank you very much to the grade 11 students for submitting that wonderful question. And, and now can, our, can, our I, can I say that if you, if you do have um, other questions, I, I think I would have time for, I know I'm the problem because I have to run to another thing. <laughs> I think I would have time for one more if you do. I do have one more question. So yes, I will and if get you, that if you want to read, if you want to read two of them, and then I'll try to answer them both. Okay, well, I have one in my hands right now, and this is coming from a grade nine class. They are at Eleanor Hall School in Clyde, Alberta. And their question is, why were some of the students not able to go home for the summer? Yeah, well, there's not, one of the really hard things about the residential school history is that there isn't one answer to anything. In some cases, it's because they were so, so far away from home. 
so for example, there were children in northern Quebec, that, and I'm not talking about the part of the province you may be familiar with, I'm talking about Nunavik, the part where the Inuit live uh, above the tree line. Some of those children and some of the kids on Baffin Island were going to school all the way over um, in Yellowknife. They had to fly down, go on a train for five days across the country at that time, and then up north, suddenly be in a place where there are trees when they were coming from a place that was above the tree line where they weren't used to seeing big trees. Everything about it was new and different, including the language. And in some cases, their parents literally did not know where they were. Um, and so it, the cost of sending children home and sending them that kind of big different distance, a lot of the decisions around residential school, sadly, were made on the basis of that's too expensive. And I think that's one of the things students and, and teachers, and I know for teachers in particular, it's very, it's, it's delicate, but I think uh, to, to not stop advocating for proper resources, you need to do what you need to do because this, those schools were all about what's, what, what can we get away with for cheap? It's why a lot of the teachers in those schools were not actually teachers. It's why a lot of the teachers in the school were um, uh, nuns or church people who had been trained in other ways, uh, but they were not trained to be teachers. And so a lot of the children actually didn't get a good education, even though they spent many years away. And in the case of some other children, um, it was because they were deemed to be orphans. In some cases, they were orphans. And also, one of the things that was a recurring story um, was that people assumed if you didn't have immediate family, that there was no other family. There was no recognition that you might have aunts and uncles and granny, others who would, would have been happy and indeed desperate to have their, their loved ones back. Um, but we were also at a time, and I know it's hard for you guys to realize it, Lisa probably remembers all of this, there was a time where the divisions between men and women were so stark, and things that were deemed to be women's roles and things that were deemed to be men's roles. And so in some cases, children, the mother had died for whatever reason. There were big epidemics, there were pandemics like now, and people died. But if it was the mom who died, it was automatically assumed that the father was incapable of raising the children. And so in the cases like that, I heard many cases of children in that circumstance, the child would be taken away. Uh, in one case, I heard of a child who was 18 months old and taken to live with the nuns basically and never left there till they were 21 years old after because they had no other home. So it's, but they're not all, it's not all one story. That's what I'm trying to say to you. So maybe a partial answer to the previous question. The other thing is be very clear and do all that you can to be well informed about where you live. And everywhere in Canada, there's not one Indigenous community that has not been affected directly or indirectly by the residential school experience. So if you do not have connections with the Indigenous communities in your midst, or if you don't have Indigenous children among your classmates or in your, in your classes, um, or among your faculty, may I say also, because we've not done a great job of having reflective workforces. Um, make that an effort, make those connections and um, see if you can invite in as subject matter experts, people who may be um, your neighbors um, down the road or in the next community or whatever, uh, get to know each other. Uh, we, we can't keep being strangers to each other in our country. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilson. And I can't think of a better way to wrap today's session with that, that call to action around being well informed. And today we have an audience of educators and students. And, and we heard from Dr. Wilson earlier, this was the first commission to come about from a court case. And this was truly a long and national conversation that the TRC uh, inspired with the goal to educate, to inform us and to help our country really learn what, what took place and to do better. So I really wanted to thank Dr. Wilson for her compelling presentation, Keeping Reconciliation Alive, Learning from a Truth and Reconciliation Commissioner. Uh, this 45 minutes we've spent together has been amazing and enlightening, but an event like this does not come to life without engaging audiences such as yourself. So thank you to all of the educators who subscribe to today's event and to all of you, the students who joined us from across the country, and as well as for those who submitted the questions. We're very grateful for you being part of this. 
At RBC, we recognize that education is a vital component of the reconciliation process, and we're so honored to be part of this important dialogue today. So just a reminder to all of the educators, Reconciliation and Me is a special broadcast by APTN, and it will be airing on APTN at 11 o'clock uh, CTET and MT time. Tune into our national broadcast titled National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. This broadcast will stream on APTM, CBC, CBC GEM, EC Tele, and EC2 TV at 8 p.m. local local time, that's 9 p.m. Atlantic time and 9.30 p.m. Newfoundland time. And then that will be followed that's by a special tomorrow. program. And that's tomorrow. That's, tomorrow. that's yes. correct. And yes. that's produced by CBC Manitoba. And please, we encourage you to all wear an orange shirt, display orange in your home, and use the hashtag Light Turtle Island Orange. We hope you enjoy the rest of the week, and we will see you tomorrow for day four's event. Thank you very much to Dr. Wilson and to all of you and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Thank